Well, hello, hello. Welcome to Speakeasy JS, the JavaScript meetup for mad science, hacking, and experiments. I'm Faros, and I'm your host this afternoon. So glad you've joined us. Uh, mad science is all about building things that make people say, I didn't know that was possible. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're joined by uh, Fred Schott. Hey, Fred. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so it's it's great that you're here. I'm really excited uh, for, for Fred's talk today. So let me just quickly introduce Fred. So Fred is founder of Pika, a project to move the JS ecosystem forward. And Pika builds tools and services for developers. And um, some of the tools you might uh, have heard of are Snowpack.js and Skypack.js. Those are um, uh, pretty cool projects. And um, hopefully, you've, you've tried them out. And um, if you haven't, uh, give, definitely give them a look. They're pretty interesting. And uh, I'm excited about Fred's talk today because I've been told that there's going to be a sneak peek of something new that he's working on. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Cool, cool. So um, and one last thing before we start. If you're enjoying Speakeasy every week, please uh, help us spread the word um, by posting about it on your favorite social media site, um, ideally right now, so that we can uh, um, help new people uh, find Speakeasy and you know recruit new mad scientists into our ranks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I was going to yeah. say, I've grown out my beard. My mad science beard is growing in anticipation of this talk. <laughs> I can tell you've, uh, you've been building it up for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I sadly just got rid of mine today. So uh, what can I say? But Gotta do it. <laughs> cool. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this talk. So uh, anything you want to say before you get started, or you want to just go for it? Let's jump into it. Let's jump into it. All right. All right. I got some slides here, I believe. I don't know if that's going to show up. Yep, they're yeah, on screen there now. We go. Awesome. And I'm going to press uh, the play button. Here we go here. There we go. I can no longer see you, so hopefully I'm not just you know screaming into the void here. Um, yeah, let's let's get started. I'm really excited to share this with you all. This is a project I have been working on for a while with a couple of other very smart people. And so this is really our first chance to kind of share this with the world. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Fred Schott. I've been working on a couple of different projects, uh, Snowpack, Skypack, um, Pika, which is a little bit lesser known, but kind of from the early days of this, this work, really all focused on a uh, core technology of JavaScript called ESM. So that's like imports, exports. Um, it's pretty kind of common language now in terms of how we think about JavaScript. Uh, but Snowpack was this kind of early way to reimagine dev tooling um, for ESM, for this new technology. And, and Skypack is a CDM that really, really leans into this as the way to distribute code. So. All of these technologies, all about ESM. Um, this is really our first project that is kind of unique. It's not really like ESM focused in that it's like, you know, something, 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 ESM is amazing, and then this happens. Um, but it's actually, it's only really made possible because we live now in a world where these unbundled build tools like Snowpack exist. So this could never exist if you were using um, like a Webpack or a Rollup. This is something that like only can exist because we now live in this new world of less bundled tooling, more kind of modern tooling um, like Snowpack. So really excited to share this. It's definitely an interesting approach to web application development. And um, really think everyone's going to get a kick out of this. Hopefully you do. Um, now, better architecture for the modern web is you know, a pretty large take. Um, you know, I, I think better is opinionated. That's definitely um, up to you, the viewer. But um, if anything, it's a new architecture. It's a new approach to web development that kind of challenges the assumptions about what we build when we say we're building websites and web apps. Um, those assumptions have built up over the last couple of years, really the last decade. And Astro exists as more of a challenge to those assumptions. And when we talk about websites, what do we mean? Um, in 30 seconds, what is Astro? Um, basically, it's a modern take on server-side rendering for websites. Um, I say, you know, Asterisks here because no no idea is new no idea is really modern we're just we're borrowing from actually some pretty old ideas here um, but it's a new take in that it brings new ideas or kind of fresh ideas from an older time into a modern stack so what happens when you do that um, you'll find out um, one thing about this that we were really really intentional about is we're not asking you to throw out your stack you know Snowpack was a build tool for whether you used React or Svelte or Vue. Um, Astro is trying to do the exact same thing. We're not saying throw out how you build um, websites and your favorite web framework. Um, we let you bring your own. So continue to use React, Preact. All of those work great with Astro. 
But what Astro really exists to help you do is build a website with zero client-side JavaScript by default. So that's very different from the kind of world of the web application, like a Next.js or any of the frameworks that exist today to help you build websites and using kind of React or a, a big JavaScript application to do it. Um, this is a very in interesting approach in that it actually kind of flips that model. We're not saying we're the best way to build a JavaScript app. We're actually saying we're the best way to build a site that ships zero JavaScript to the client. Um, you have to kind of opt in to JavaScript if you want it to go to the, to the user. We do this by really being the first framework that leans into and implements Island's architecture. Um, I'll get into that in a second, but that gives us this other feature called partial hydration, which is that whole idea of opting into behavior as you need it. Um, the quick, you know, the skinny on Island's architecture, it's actually a, a more kind of you know, newer term um, coined by Jason Miller of Preact and, uh, and Google fame. And this image here is probably just the best way to show that off. It kind of speaks for itself. Instead of you building an application and thinking about your website as a huge, you know, an application, I won't say huge, um, you think of every, what you're building is actually a document. You're building an HTML document, um, and that's the base language of what you're building. So huge is an easy kind of jab because more often than not, you start to build and build and build, and your application gets bigger and bigger, and the user ends up kind of feeling that burden. Um, you have to really go out of your way to make a site that is an entire application not feel like that. Um, and so SSR and server optimizations, and there are plenty of tricks up, up our sleeves as web developers to do that. But at the end of the day, you're trying to just optimize a flow where you're sending an application to a user um, versus sending a document, which is kind of the OG way to think about the web. It's an HTML document that the user gets in their browser and functionality is added onto that. So Island's architecture is really leaning into that more original idea of, we're giving the user an HTML uh, web page by default, but we're also letting the developer opt in different components with functionality. So in this example here, right, the main page has server rendered HTML, a footer, um, but maybe that header needs a little bit of functionality or like an image carousel, right? Like images are moving across the screen that requires some functionality. Um, Islands architecture says hydrate those almost as their own isolated component trees almost like mini applications on your site. And by separating them from each other, they are getting all these benefits of isolation um, and actually kind of performing a little bit better, right? The header can come in as soon as it loads and a heavy like image carousel won't actually slow that down. So you have these almost isolated areas of, of behavior on your site, but at the end of the day, it's only opt-in and the default is this HTML static um, language that you're speaking to the browser. And so that idea of, opting in to functionality, which really means opting into a heavier payload as you need it. Um, that's really what is at the heart of this feature called partial hydration. This has been really difficult to do in a traditional um, web application like Next.js or Gatsby. Um, there are definitely a couple of projects to, uh, to explore this. Um, Nate Moore, who actually worked on Astro, works on Astro with us, uh, created one called Microsite, um, which is that same idea of partial hydration for Preact, but the problem they all fall into is you're trying to take this application and pull it apart. Um, so pulling one component out of an application, you're all of a sudden you don't really know if that's safe to do, right? Does it borrow from some state here or some you know, assumption about the component there? What we try and do is by default, it's all server rendered. So by default, you're speaking this language of a server rendered document. Um, and then individual components, instead of being pulled out of an of a, of a application are actually being injected into a document. So it's a totally different kind of static first approach where the result is that you actually have to opt into all of your payloads and everything becomes much lighter as a result. If you don't care, if there's no actual dynamic behavior on the browser, um, then you don't ever opt in and your site is kind of lighter weight. There's no like layout components that your user is generating because you needed them to render it uh, you know, for the first load and then never again. It's, it's really only the behavior that needs it gets sent. And so really what we're trying to do is we're trying to walk this line. We're trying to revisit this discussion about JavaScript versus HTML. Um, not like you know, the turf wars of what's better, but more JavaScript is this really expressive language. It has so much power behind it. Um, but the result is that you end up with performance being something you really have to keep in line, right? When you're only speaking the language of JavaScript, performance becomes a real concern about how you build your site, how you optimize it, how you bundle it. Um, 
HTML doesn't have that same problem, right? It's it's the static content you send. It it doesn't load dependencies. It's just it's a document. Um, so it's lower powered, but much much faster by default. Um, the reason I say that we borrow from old ideas, right? Like you can think of almost like a Rails app or a PHP web server or a Django, right? It's they're borrowing from the same idea that we are generating at the end of the day HTML and behavior is an add-on. That's very different from um, a web application like Next.js that has, you know, you're building an application that's gonna run in both places and we're sending the user parts of that application and they're gonna run. We're kind of borrowing from that idea of a web server's job and the web application that you're building um, is about, at the end of the day, generating HTML. Um, other static site generators have done this, so Eleventy and, and Hugo and any other one, right? That's another approach where the end result is HTML. You're taking like Markdown and creating HTML. But they do that by basically like pushing JavaScript out of the way, saying like, we don't touch that. Um, Eleventy is a great example of this, where they have this really nice Markdown um, content authorship. But the second you want to build any sort of advanced application behavior on the front end, you're bringing in your own bundler like Webpack or maybe Snowpack. Um, you are having to go and essentially jam these two tools together to make a fully featured dynamic site. So Astro is trying to bridge the gap between these. Can, is there a way to build a site that has the expression and power of JavaScript and the speed of, of you know, something that is essentially just a document by default, static by default? And again, there's that kind of interplay as well with which you base your site on, which is really like a web app versus a website. And again, this is all about terminology. You can argue the definition and you can argue what's better, but really we're trying to piece apart, is there a way to get the most of both worlds here to get the like expressiveness and power and flexibility of a web application without shipping the user entire you know, JavaScript code that they have to run just to render your site? Even with server-side rendering, you end up entering what you, know, you can kind of call the uncanny valley of web performance, which is that the site has been sent as a server-side rendered HTML, but now you need to send the whole application to kind of make it dynamic. So users, especially on a phone or a lower power device on a, a worse internet connection, have this moment where they see a site, but they can't click it, they can't interact with it because the application hasn't been sent over yet. Um, so is there a way to kind of walk the line between these ideas as well, that you build something using components, using this architecture that feels very modern and web app-like as a developer. But again, what you're building is at the end of the day, um, something that's giving static documents to the browser and only hydrating what's needed versus the flip side of, of a big application. So this is Astro. Like in a nutshell, what we're trying to solve here is a modern web development experience, but that serves static content by default and a really light payload by default. Not limiting what you can build, but you know, really boosting the performance by changing the language that you speak from JavaScript application to website and document based. Let's jump into some code. Um, that's the best way to show this off. Um, I will say I will kind of prefix this with its new alpha software. We're still doing some pretty heavy development on this. Um, it is not open sourced yet. Um, I will share a link um, at the end to where you could go to get um, essentially join our Discord, get an invite. You know, we are definitely getting ready to um, open this up soon. But for now, what we're talking about is you know, this kind of early demo. Some bugs might be expected, I promise. It's OK. Um, if I create a bug, then you know, <laughs> everyone else can create a bug too. It's all, it's all part of the, the fun. So what we're going to do and um, you know, what we're going to build here in this demo is essentially a blog. Um, You'll see here a couple of reference to the Muppets. It's going to be a Muppets blog. We're going to learn about the Muppets as a part of this demo. Um, and um, in the left-hand corner, I'll kind of give a little overview of the architecture of your site if you're building with Astro. So in a project that's an Astro project, there's nothing much here. You can see this hello world run in. I've already started the dev server. A project is really just two folders. One is a public folder. That's where any sort of like just static assets go. Um, again, our first Muppets references kind of kind of found here. Some great old school '90s, um, even '80s maybe. <laughs> this piggy, you got animal, you got okay. These are our static assets, right? They, I'm sad to say, I never I never watched the Muppets. I definitely saw the cartoons and some of the movies, but I think I was old enough that it was like a nostalgic. Um, <laughs> wait, Gonzo's just getting bigger. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say I remember much from it. Um, 
Then in your Astro folder, that's that's kind of where we're going to start building the site itself. So we have a couple of fo couple of folders here. We'll go into them all in detail, but components, data, layouts, and really pages is where the meat of this lives. Um, we try to follow a um, file-based routing system that you'll see in like a, a, a Next.js. This idea of everything that's in your pages directory is built into a final page. So pages slash index would be your final um, homepage, right? Index being the kind of keyword for a homepage here. Now, all we have so far is a hello world, right? You can kind of see it here. There's an H1, that's our header. Um, the main thing about Astro is that at the end of the day, what we're trying to make this feel like is you're writing HTML. So we have this concept of a dot Astro file. That'll probably be your first kind of like, oh, this is something new. But really, it's HTML. It's like the what you're trying to write is HTML. It's a superset of HTML. Um, so all we have here, right? Anything you copy and paste from a tutorial or a blog post, copy and paste it in here. It'll render exactly as if it were an HTML document. Um, now, the screen size is going to be an issue here, but I will do my best, right? You can kind of see we've done a little bit of processing to this, but at the end of the day, it's an H1. These classes are just added, um, and you'll see in a second why. Now, here is kind of the most, like, we'll just jump right into what makes Astro special. How do you bring uh, components or kind of logic into the world of Astro? Um, how, do, how do we bring these two worlds together? Um, if you've used Svelte or Vue, they have this idea of a script. Um, a script like for a component. Uh, we're going to do something similar here, where we're going to create something that looks a lot like front matter. Um, and anything within here becomes JavaScript. Um, it's component JavaScript. It's the it's behavior of your component that you're writing, this HTML. So it doesn't get shipped to the user. It's just going to let us define, like let's say, um, a title here. And let's create you know, hello world um, with a couple more exclamation marks so that we can see. And then. Let's just turn these. Now, how you use them is meant to feel a lot like JSX. So again, can't stress enough, we are borrowing from the greats here. Um, we're not trying to create a whole new syntax of templating. We're trying to use something that feels a lot like what you'd be familiar with coming from React or, or even Svelte, um, which is this idea of using curly brace, bra bracelets. Bra bra bracelets? Wow, that's a hard word. Um, curly bracelets to um, title, um, to reference your variables up there. Brackets, thank you. Brackets is the word I'm looking for. Bra brackets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, bracelets? Um, right, so it's essentially, you could think of this almost like here's your like JSX of a React component, and then here's like the JavaScript that lives above it. Um, or again, in Svelte and Vue, they have this idea of a script that kind of lives with the single um, component. Um, but this can be any full expression, right? So you could do something like title dot, I don't know, to uppercase. I can't remember if that's built in. Um, plus. All oh, right, that's the title of uh, the site in HTML. Let's put it down here. There you go. Put a little space there. So this is meant to feel like JSX. It's meant to feel like a normal kind of templating language. But again, we haven't sent anything to the browser yet. This is fully, you know, we can open up at least so that you all believe me. You know, we have JavaScript here filtered. There's nothing. Zero, zero everything here. Um, the other thing that we're trying to bring from this more modern web dev, dev world is the idea of components. So right now, let's just put in, and this is where we can kind of dig into our components world. Let's say nav, I think, doesn't require much. So import nav from components, uh, and we'll call it nav. And then you would use that like a component. So let's just put that right at the top of the page. Um, I think it's fine to just put it here. We'll refresh. I got I to gotta minimize a little bit. Um, remember, we're bringing it. We're building a Muppets blog. So here's our first kind of header that we've grabbed. Um, this is an Astro component, right? So we've been looking at pages, but it's also it's a component system, right? So this is still just native, you know, HTML document stuff. We've essentially defined a snippet here. Um, if you wanted to, you could do you know eight of these. And I think they would all work. Um, styling is really nice. We we borrow a lot from from component systems around styling as well. We let you, first of all, you can write SAS. By default, you just have to add this lang equals. We compile that down for you automatically. Um, it's also scoped. So if you added some sort of color here or some sort of thing that you were worried about bleeding out, it's all scoped within the component for you automatically. So those, those classes that I showed you in the compiled output earlier, um, that's all to basically for, you know, by default with nothing for you special, you can think of your styles as component scoped. 
So if you add a header somewhere else, it wouldn't bleed out of this. You know, you are styling this header, and that's that. Let's see, what else can we add here? So I, before we get into the blog, I'll just show one more kind of cool thing. Uh, you know, I talked a lot about partial hydration. Let's actually show that off. Um, you might have noticed here that we have an idea of a React component here. So literally, this is like from the React doc site, a React counter. Um, super simple, you know, count, all this stuff. Um, every time you click a button, it increases. So let's let's bring that. Let's bring a React component into your page. So I'll just do a quick little counter here. Wait, can I can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so before you import that counter, so far there's no JavaScript being shipped down to the browser. Is that right? Yes. If you look in the network panel, zero JavaScript uh, requests. And what about inline scripts? Um, we treat that so so part of respecting your HTML as HTML means we will. You know, if you try and do something like this, we'll we'll treat that as is. I don't know if this is what you meant by inline scripts. Oh, you're not adding any kind of inline scripts or anything like that. No, totally server rendered. The thing okay. that you know, if we even like view source this. Okay, so so far it's sort of like these components are like uh, partials, server side partials, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. It's yeah, it's like a, it's almost like a server, like an OG like templating language for your Express server, but. It feels a lot more like something more modern, where you're using components mm -hmm. that are React and, and you're using JSX. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, this is all just compiled output, zero JavaScript, sent to the user. Okay. Cool. Cool. So counter. Let's just put this in the. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, right. It's not an extra file to JSX. Okay. So. Now this is where if you're using React to like build layouts and presentational components, like this could be it, right? Imagine this was an image or something that was styled. Um, you'd be fine with this. Like this is good. Like it's it's an image and it's there. You've seen it. It, it rendered its server side. There's still no client side JavaScript. But counter is one of those interesting examples where you actually want it to be opt in. So unlike that layout component or that you know image component or anything that just rendered something that was fine as is, we actually want some behavior. When I click this button. There's no JavaScript. It's not going to do anything. <laughs> so we have this idea of you opting into behavior. I want this to run on the browser, which means I'm opting in. Um, the easiest one to do is just idle, which is that when your site idles, we're going to now load some JavaScript. Um, this is the dev server. So this is a little more broken out than you would see in production. In production, this will be bundled by default um, into a single file, essentially. But for now, it's essentially the dev server. Here's your counter. You know, This is the code you wrote. Got your React, you got your use state. Now, if I click this, it's actually doing something. Um, you can also do visible, which is a little bit tougher to show. Maybe I'll just have to kind of do like a million breakpoints here. Oh, actually, break. I might get mad about breakpoints. The, the syntax highlighter might. All right, I'll do a. Let's try this. I think this should work. Hopefully, it doesn't get mad about this. Okay, and we will. OK, so it's not on the screen right now. It's not visible. No JavaScript. As soon as you scroll into the frame, JavaScript. Nice. So this is really cool. So if you have a site of you know, a larger page and there's functionality, but it's not visible, um, you essentially don't care about it. Load it when you get there. Um, but above the fold, you know, the user is trying to get that first experience, that first look at your site. Um, it's not going to have any cost to the JavaScript that gets sent to your browser. So that's really cool. I love that feature. That's like one of my favorites. Yeah, that's super easy. Um, let's back to, I'll zoom out a little bit to save you all from. But this this is totally just me, but this uh, Time New Roman is really messing with me. So um, this could be a good way to show off how scoping works. Because again, I think we're saying like basically, you know, what's going to happen if I do this? Um, font family equals um, sans serif, I want to say. There we go, nice. OK, a little bit nicer there. So we have basically shown off this idea of like really basic JavaScript, um, HTML, kind of how we bring these two things together to create a really light payload. Um, we also haven't really talked much about the authoring experience. So this is a blog, right? We have blog posts. Um, I think I actually saved one of the URLs here. Let me grab it from my other tab. So 
inside of this, we have a bunch of markdown documents. It's, a, it's essentially the summary of the document. Um, and what we have is the rendered output when you go to that URL. So again, everything in pages is a URL. There's post slash Muppets from space. That's you know, Muppets from space right here. We've done some work to, you know, it's a blog, so we would have tagged some things, we put some dates in. Um, but you know, this is your content here. Now, Markdown doesn't really have a like idea of its layout by default, right? It would be kind of annoying to say, like, okay, well, inside this markdown, I want to say HTML and body. Like all of a sudden you're like, that's not what anyone wants to do. So a markdown page is special in that it can actually define a layout. Um, what we have here is just a really simple layout post. Um, which this has been a little bit more developed, but we have this idea of some, you know, an author card. Um, we've actually brought some head um, elements that are, you know, often repeated into a component, and it's going to get content as essentially a prop. So a lot like Svelte, we're borrowing from this idea of your props are exported variables, and by exporting content, we're basically telling the world I take content as a prop. So this is exactly what Svelte does. It's this idea that your props are then defined via this little snippet, and then when it goes to render it because it's a layout for a certain post, that post becomes the content. So you're now available to say title, description. Um, we support TypeScript as well. So this could be something if you've defined what post, you know, we should give you a post uh, type. Um, you could do this as well and get that actually defined um, to give you syntax errors down here. If you, you know, for some reason, do the wrong thing. So we have really nice like authorship of Markdown here, where you can write your you know layout and then reuse that for every one of these pages. So Muppets from Space, Muppets Treasure Island, right? They're all supported and rendered via one template, multiple different uh, Markdown documents that all um, you know map one to one with their final URL here. What's really cool here, which I don't think you know, this isn't going to be given to us for free. I wonder if I can just kind of let's throw a counter in there. Let's see if this works. So. MDX is this really cool project that exists, which is to get React components into Markdown. And it's a really cool project, but it definitely takes a lot of work to set up, at least in my experience. Um, you need to define you know, your bundler correctly. You need to define the build step correctly. Um, all of this stuff you know, ends up making a lot of kind of config to get components in Markdown working. Um, for us, it is as simple as doing a counter here. And then I think oh, I'm going to maybe get this right. Oh, I'm worried I'm not going to get this right. Uh, let me check this out real quick. Um, I think it's simple. Oh, no, I don't even have it. Oh, here we go. There we go. I'm going to borrow from someone else who's done this. Oh, no, maybe I don't. Oh, boo. OK, well, you can poke around here. I'll, I'll try one or two until I get it wrong. So this is me browsing the code base to try and find it. Um, I that's think okay. it's that's, something that's the, like. It's the fun of doing it live. <laughs> um, oh god! Do you actually know? Do you know YAML syntax? I, I think it's a map. So whatever, um, like this uh, maybe is the right thing. Uh, what do we think about this? Let's try this. Are you missing an ending quote? Yeah. Okay. And capitalization here. Okay. I don't know if this will work. We'll try. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think. Oh, wait, are we, no, Treasure Island. We need Treasure Island. That's Treasure Island. Oh, I think that's not it. And now it's. Yeah. Oh, I really wanted the work. OK, I'm not sure if that's a not found because I've broken it in some horrible way. Um, but it's the OK. Promise, we, we, have, yeah. we, have, we get the idea because, I mean, you're showing us an early preview. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, the promise here is that we basically give you these components for free inside your Markdown. So you can imagine this if you were writing a blog post, you know, YouTube, embed. Um, you could do tweet, you know, ID equals and it's some URL. Um, there's really cool, just like for free, we basically get you this really nice um, components in Markdown story, which traditionally has been really hard to do when you have to worry about how that gets bundled and built and compiled. Um, because everything is becoming this HTML document at the end of the day, Adding a component is the same as adding, you know, a paragraph or a header. It's this one thing that goes in. Is that using MDX itself, or is that your own like kind of implementation? Does the same is the same thing? We are definitely resting on their shoulders in terms of having a Markdown parser that can support this. But mm -hmm. that's about where we draw the line. And then, really, a lot of what MDX does is 
integrates these two, you know, a JavaScript build system with a Markdown build system. And what we try and do is turn the Markdown into HTML. And then again, Astro is essentially a superset of that. So then we also just understand it natively. Um, so we use their parser, but then we get this a lot more for free than an MDX or a, a bundled Webpack solution would because we're speaking this language of HTML. Thanks. Um, the last thing here, which is worth showing off because we just got it working and it's super cool, um, is this idea. Let me see if I can kind of, I'm going to have to copy paste a little bit. Um, I'll end on this. Um, there's plenty more here to show off, but this is kind of the coolest, like, I'm trying to build a blog, how do I do it story. Um, we support collections too. So this is the last thing I'll show. Um, a collection starts with a dollar sign here, and I'm just going to paste in some, some stuff and we can, can talk about it. And then let's go to slash posts. Hopefully this compiles. Always the risk with a big copy paste. Da, 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 da. Actually, you know what I might just do? I might just check out all the changes I made. Ah, uh, yeah, see it has, I oh, know it doesn't, this should be working, okay, one more try. If not, we'll just go over the code. Yeah, so we clearly resolved it. Um, not sure what's going on here. So I'll just walk through the code there because this is really cool for creating a collection. Um, say you have um, you know, a blog would show many posts, maybe every title of every post, or you wanna paginate some results. Um, so we have this idea of, of a special type of page, which is itself a collection. And you define here how that gets essentially loaded. So here, this is a collection of posts. We're gonna fetch every post. We're gonna sort them, and then we're gonna return them. And essentially, this is describing what gets added into this collection prop. So at the end of the day, collection is essentially just a collection of posts that now this template is able to render. So it can kind of get back some metadata, like what's the next page, what's the previous page. Um, give me, you know, essentially map over every post in this collection. Um, and here we have this post preview component that's going to do that. Um, it's this really nice kind of like way to do pagination that doesn't require you like give us every URL. It doesn't require a lot of work on your part. We're essentially just saying, hey, you give us the posts and we'll give you back the collection with all the URLs and pagination. Um, we can do filtering, we can do kind of grouping. It's this really nice API for describing what a collection of posts might look like. Um, again, I don't know, I've, I've definitely broken something here, but. Uh, it looks like fetch content for some reason didn't return. Anyway, that is the kind of dream of that. Um, we'll go back to this nice little place, <laughs> this, this nice little safe uh, environment here. Um, but yeah, so at the end of the day, the kind of what we're trying to do is we're trying to give a component story like Svelte or like even React, where you have styling handled for you, uh, so that's more Svelte. Um, and you have like these expressions that feel just like very much like JSX. That's kind of the React part of this. Um, but behind all of it is we're not trying to create a syntax that does a lot of client side reactivity or has to worry about state updates. Like really, we're just thinking about what gives you HTML to the user, to the browser um, as easily as possible. So we get this really clean and simple syntax language that doesn't worry about state updates and reactivity. It just focuses on like what's the best way to render HTML. And then when you need reactivity, when you need something that works on the client, you just reach for your favorite component uh, language. So reach for React, reach for Svelte, whatever you like to use. And then our job is to essentially ship that to the browser um, for free. If, if you were migrating something big, you could literally just do, you know, like my Svelte app, um, you know, give that the idle. And you've got an SBA, right? You've got this thing that's now running fully as an application in the browser. That's totally fine as well especially if you're trying to migrate something like this has a router and now you're trying to migrate away from it. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do when you just change your foundation to HTML. Um, that's about it. That's all I really have to demo here. There's a ton of other features. If they jump out to me, um, I'll try and pinpoint them. But um, yeah, that's, that's the main heart of the demo. Sweet. Thanks for showing us that. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I can tell it's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, a fresh uh, design because of the uh, <laughs> some of the challenges that you're running into. But that's why this is cool. This is it's it's cool to see like as you're developing it, what you're thinking about, and um, you know, the goals make a lot of sense to me. Um, there was a question that jumped out in the chat that people were a lot of people were asking, um, and uh, I was wondering about as well, which is how. Uh, so you you mentioned uh, you know you have this system for 
pulling in the JavaScript for a component once it becomes visible um, by annotating the component with that little colon visible um, uh, string there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you claimed that there was no JavaScript in the page before that, that uh, component loaded in its JavaScript. So the question is, how does that work? How do you, how do you load JavaScript uh, when something becomes visible without JavaScript being on the page already? <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is a good point. Um, so you're right. There's actually a little bit of a trick there, which is I was showing. Let's even see if we can get back to um, visible. OK, right. So and then let's actually just add all those BRs back. All right. Now you're well far down the page. So that was a good, a good call out. I, I probably should be a little more clear there. It's not that there's no JavaScript on the page. Um, but there is no like JavaScript request that has to go out to hydrate that. So you can see here, I believe what we do is we add a script to the end of your page. It's inline. It essentially runs you know, almost immediately. And that is what's going to basically create that intersection observer. Um, it's going to do a dynamic import of the things that you need. And that's going to call React Render on that component. Um, so good call. It's not that there's no JavaScript. It's that there's no kind of request. Um, you know, no request that might slow down your page until that's ready. So we essentially mm -hmm. create this intersection observer, but then it's just observing the page. It's not actually um, going out and loading other things. The page isn't blocked by it. It's almost like asynchronously detached from your website performance story, other than increasing the size of your HTML payload by a, by a small amount. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So and and, and so and if you added more stuff into this component, um, you know, let's say you. You made it a lot more featureful. It's not going to bloat the size of the original page. It's the the, the amount of sort of uh, increase in this script that you're including here is is based on it looks like the number of lazily loaded components and yeah. versus like the size of those components, right? Yeah, exactly. Like this counter JS could go and download a hundred different files, but you wouldn't hit that cost until it became visible. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. OK, that makes a lot of sense. Have you considered uh, not to go too rabbit holey on this, uh, you know, to go too deep? Oh, this is the fun part. part. <laughs> I'm just wondering. There's there's a new uh, attribute, uh, an HTML attribute, that lets you lazily load images. And I believe it also works on iframes. Um, oh, cool. It, I was just wondering if you had considered that approach, given that, like, you know, you, you, you this whole idea of uh, you, you were talking about how components you're kind of calling you're calling them apps um, because they're I, I think you're trying to sort of represent that they're more like isolated and more contained than like a typical component and they don't rely mm -hmm. on the surrounding environment. I mean, why not why not just go all out and make it an iframe with a lazy loading <laughs> on it and then you then you okay. literally oh, no. actually, you could have no JS on the page until that iframe is scrolled with you know into into view. <laughs> that's a really no no that's actually really interesting. Um, a framework that does this well is Marco, um, where they actually take a, a totally different approach, which is that they will, um, at, they will like if anything is loading asynchronously, they will skip it essentially and put a placeholder into the HTML, so it's streaming now this HTML response, um, and then at the end, before they close the the actual body, like the the connection's still open, once one of those things renders asynchronously, they'll like inject the the real content into the page because they still have that connection open. So it's a really interesting approach there as well that we've been looking at. I hadn't heard the iframe one. That's that's pretty clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might run into issues with the cross-browser support on it or with yeah. the lack of control. I don't think it gives you much control over like when it decides something is in view. So it's like, some uh, heuristic yeah. that the browser uses. So it might start like loading it in you know, when it's a thousand pixels off screen, which might not be exactly what you want. So, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> no, that's. I mean, there, there's a lot of parallels here to like the micro front ends movement, which is like I think very much aligned with like every component is an app. I don't know if I like have made that leap myself. So, like, I, I don't know. I have so much like old web baggage from iframes. Um, I don't know if I've really made that that leap mentally, but that is. Um, yeah, I mean, we're we're definitely like talking about every component as an isolated running. You know, call it an application. It's a component tree that has its own state. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, so is there any other ways that they're different than um, traditional components besides the fact that I mean? So, I guess one question is how uh, much of an isolation guarantee is there? Like, can can it, can an app um, in this model like not communicate at all with other apps? Like, is there no state sharing or events? Oh, good question. Yeah. It, well, so this is where you start to, because we're not really taking a stance on what framework you're using, you are a little bit, the answer changes based on the framework. Um, this is where I don't know 
I don't think I'm going to be able to build a demo without doing some heavy stack overflowing. Um, but whatever you're using, if you're using something that shares reactivity more in like the kind of um, Svelte's, Svelte's idea of stores would probably be the closest idea here, which is like um, anything that says you import it from this kind of shared place and that's where the state is. So like importing like almost a store, um, my app store from, and we'll call this, you know, component, or we'll just, we'll just say, you know, store. Um, this idea of if you manage a state like this, right, all those components would be loading state from that same place. Even if you have, you know, 10 different components, as long as they're all sharing this as a reference, by this URL in the browser, that's going to be one shared um, instance in the browser. So it depends on how you're doing it. Like sharing providers in React gets a little messy. It's all, it's all doable. But um, there's that idea of as long as you build your state in a way that it can be shared by kind of reference, um, by many components, then you you can lean on that and and get that full cross component tree state communication. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, so you don't really need to build in support if if the module system is giving you this way to kind of get a shared reference. That's that's yeah really yeah. So Svelte but... supports that by default. I think Recoil is the name of the React one. I'd have to check. That kind of brings that same idea. I believe Vue has theirs, um, and I think even like a Redux world, like something you know, no matter what, as long as there is the idea of a single state store that lives somewhere and can be referenced, then you're in good hands to kind of just have every component tree reference that state. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So what made you think that that uh, the world needs uh, another JavaScript framework? Uh, is it just that this approach, you think this approach is like um, uh, just, I mean, like different enough and and like better enough. Uh, like well, I guess what convinced you? What convinced you that the world needed another <laughs> another framework? Yeah. yeah, I definitely wouldn't call it a JavaScript framework, but but like another yeah web kind of how to build websites. Um, it was actually an experience when we launched the Snowpack dev uh, doc site. Let me like just jump to that real quick. All right, so we were building Snowpack. We did a nice little re rebuild of this, uh, where we kind of went from a, a large you know a large website to a smaller kind of more concise and redesigned doc site. Um, when we launched this, I got a DM from Alex Russell, um, who, if you know, is like on Twitter, is like kind of this like curmudgeon of performance, like mm -hmm. is always calling out bad performance and always like super excited about good performance. That's so like their brand is is good performance and and really being mm -hmm. an advocate for the fact that most web users are on these lower powered, um, you know, um, lower connected mobile phones. And he reached out to it when we launched this. Was like, oh my god, I mean, like amazing job with the site. The performance is incredible. Like awesome. Like wasn't that he's never that if you know effusive, but was super like way to go, which I've like never gotten from him before. And we hadn't actually spent any time on performance, was it was the wild part of it. Like we built it with 11D. So it was really a shout out to 11 D. Um, but it like kind of shook me because it's like, how much of my life have I spent trying to make sure that the site was fast? And here I was like not trying and it worked. And it's not because I'm a brilliant developer or anyone who worked on this is, it was because we use this like HTML first 11D approach where you know, what 11 does is they make it kind of difficult to add a lot of client-side reactivity. So by default, you're kind of pushed away from it. What I wanted to do was instead of making it difficult, just make it really explicit that you're opting in um, mm. versus implicit, which is that I'm building the site. And because I'm building the site, my payload's getting bigger. Like that's the story versus, you know, you know, if any framework did that today, we'd be happy. But it's so built into the mental model of how a lot of people think of websites now that we wanted to show that it was possible to build a site that was HTML first, but not like because JavaScript's then hard to do, more just that it's a choice, a design choice. And by speaking that language of HTML first, you're already like kind of set up for success versus set up for failure. Mm -hmm. Right, interesting. And if the system is, is you know, doesn't penalize um, you know adding more complexity to components, then there's, there's no reason to, to rely on like just making it hard. Why not just make it sort of, uh, up to the developer to you know to determine whether they they need that component to be dynamic on the client or not, and just make it very opt-in, very explicit. Right, right. Like this is built with um, 11D as the kind of foundation, and then Snowpack, you know, running as the thing that gives us. We have a plugin catalog, for example, and that's totally client side. Um, but when you're developing the site, you really feel like I have jammed 11D and Snowpack together, and mm -hmm. like they're having trouble kind of trading off their responsibilities a bit. Like I hit save. It rebuilds a bunch of HTML. Snowpack thinks that that's a new file being built. Like, you can just tell it's like two projects running together. We wanted to like bring that together. Modern 
JavaScript dev experience and a HTML for a site builder. Mm -hmm. So let's do some questions from the audience now. We have some questions in the chat. Um, so one question here is, um, uh, oops, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing here. Um, so when, when, you do the, when you do the final build, is it just one JS chunk that shows up for every visible component? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I'm not sure I want to get away with this. It's still you know, to, be, to be seen if it would work. But um, what's interesting about this is like the whole idea of a web app um, you know, that's using file-based routing and like a Next.js or a Gatsby. And like they're all thinking in terms of like, this page is my entry point. Um, we're thinking a very different world, right? You're opting in components to behavior. So we actually think of your components as the entry points. Mm -hmm. So the way that we think about it is, yeah, we're going to bundle your app by basically the number of components that you actually end up using in the browser. So right in this example, we're using the counter. That's one. So we essentially just bundle out a uh, counter.js single JavaScript file and a single CSS file if any CSS was referenced inside of that. Um, and that's it. If you used like counter, you know, and then maybe like, you know, let's say like nav was somehow JavaScript-y, then that would be two kind of bundles, two code split bundles, um, and so on and so on. So we're actually kind of changing the definition there a little bit. And I think we might be the first ones to do this really as a default option, which is that you're thinking of the components as what you're bundling by, not the page. Mm -hmm. uh, which also gives you a really nice reuse. So if you then have this counter on another page, you're not really at the same risk of, oh, well, like because of its size, that got bundled in the original page. So now this is a new page. So reload it again the second time. You're not really falling into that trap of like you know, any inefficiency that comes with different pages rebundling and kind of increasing their bundle size for, um, for any reason. Instead, the component is the source of truth. So as soon as you see that component again, it's now downloaded and ready to use. There's no um, chance of it to be kind of like less efficiently loaded as a part of a different page. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So um, there's a couple questions here uh, about um, like ESM and what, what specifically about ESM enables this. And is it possible to use this with common JS? Nice, yeah, good question. I actually don't think we showed that as much here. Like, let me see, is there some sort of like import? Um, okay, what's a good, what's a good package? Um, I'm biased. I'll, I'll say one of mine if you ask me. <laughs> OK. Uh, I, I'm scared that yours might not work. <laughs> That's not a big deal. I'm just worried it's like more nobody. What is it? Let's I, do it. I we'll try. We'll no, try. no, no. I haven't published. Uh, I haven't gotten all of my stuff over to the new ESM model with all the new package JSON stuff. I'm being. Uh, I'm dragging my feet. So you, let's, you try let's, let's try it. Okay, web let's torrent. try it. OK, WebTorrent. Try WebTorrent. <laughs> OK. Is it just literally one word? Yep. OK. And then let's just, because we're being a little more cautious here, we'll just console.log it. Um, I think I'll need to npm install it as well. Um, so we're using Snowpack behind the scenes here. So Astro is very much building on top of Snowpack. Um, let's see if this takes a while. Oh, yeah, I'm really worried this isn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have picked a nicer one. That This one has like a, a bunch of. Uh, yeah, I'm calling it. I'm calling it. I'm just kidding. I'm doing something <laughs> fun and happy. Oh, dear, I can say. Fair enough. Uh, this should work. BMI, Canvas. Yeah, that's that's always a problem with Snowpack is like the more nodey a package is, the harder it is to kind of bring it up for the web. Well, um, no, it, it, it does work on the web. I mean, that's sort of the point of it, but it, it doesn't have ESM. That's all. Oh, OK. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Let's yeah, see. it's it's not nodey. Yeah, it's, it's actually a browser first kind of thing. Oh, okay, then, then that should work. Then I'm just being overcautious. <laughs> it's okay. Let's let's let's, uh, let's have let's hopefully see the demo working. You know. Yeah. So let's see. So we have this right. It's on the browser. We've loaded all these things. There should be a console log here. Yep, that's that. And now let's just kind of call it. That should also. Ooh, document is not defined. Actually, let's. Yeah, I think we need to move it into the component itself. Oh, right. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. So this is not oh. a good React, right? Every time this re-renders, we're going to, I think, create confetti. I'll look at that. That's terrible. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so this, even if this was common JS, what Snowpack does behind the scenes is it turns any package into ESM. So no matter how this was written, we're essentially running, um, and you can see it here, we're turning Canvas confetti the package into this kind of JavaScript file, this ESM JavaScript file. Um, so we get a lot for free by building on top of Snowpack here. 
um, and how it handles ESM versus CommonJS and kind of just tries to make it all work for you as much as possible. Um, the question that it kind of comes back to something I started with, which is like, this is only possible because of Snowpack. Um, what do I mean by that? So Snowpack, by not being like a JavaScript bundler and being more of a like, we build assets for the web, like we turn your TypeScript into JavaScript, we turn your SAS into CSS. Um, it's just almost like we're, we're really like conceptually what we're building is like more of a like asset builder, like a web builder versus a JavaScript bundler. And so this idea of being HTML first and like why hasn't there been more innovation, like more options in the space is because most people are building on JavaScript bundlers. And so they're speaking a language of JavaScript, right? Like if you think about, okay, I need to bundle my site and my dev environment is a bundler, my build pipelines up there, bundle, bundle, bundle. Really what you're saying is like JavaScript bundler. And that means you're speaking JavaScript by default. By Snowpack, like kind of being agnostic to that, like we bundle totally fine as in production, but really we treat every asset as equal. So we build JavaScript, we build CSS, and we build HTML. And this idea of having an authoring format that outputs to HTML is a lot easier if you're not, at the end of the day, trying to pipe it through a JavaScript bundler. Um, again, you can bundle at the end of the day, but by being a build tool that's agnostic to all that, outputting HTML actually becomes pretty straightforward for us. Mm -hmm. That's not to say it's impossible in a more traditional kind of webpacky setup, but we've just kind of changed the language that we speak from JavaScript first to really agnostic. And having a build tool that's done that lets us start to build just things that kind of challenge the status quo about authoring formats and, and language. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Cool. So I think we're about out of time for, um, for questions. But um, this has been great. Fred, thanks a lot for showing this to us. Um, super interesting. Um, and like, uh, where, where should people go to follow this? Is there a GitHub repo for it yet? Is it open source yet? Oh, I stopped sharing my screen too soon. Oh. <laughs> I got so excited. <laughs> Give me one second. OK, here, I'll bring it up. Um, there's a whole slide just for that. Um, yes, astro.build is our kind of like homepage for the project. Um, and there is right now not much on there, but it is a, uh, a uh, button to join our Discord. And from there, we're going to start inviting people to an early preview of this. So right now, the repo is still closed. It's not really published in a package yet. but. We're excited to start opening this up to more people, especially once we work out the uh, the kinks. Cool, that's amazing. All right, well, don't go just yet if you're watching because we're we're going into the uh, social portion of Speakeasy, which is if you haven't uh, done this before, what we do is we go over to another uh, platform where we can actually just chat with each other, and uh, you will get paired with um, other attendees and potentially Fred or me. So you'll be able to ask your question directly to uh, Fred if you get paired with him. And it's kind of random, uh, so it's sort of you know you gotta hope you gotta hope that the uh, random number generator is uh, gonna work in your favor if, if, if that's what you gotta do. But um, but yeah, so it'll be fun. We're gonna go over there now. I'll put up um, a little slide here that explains uh, how it works. Just go to uh, speakeasy.co/js in your browser now, and uh, we will. Um, We'll all be there. Uh, just hit tap to start, and um, we'll, we'll we'll go and hang out. So you know, this is the way we, we bring the kind of social part of a meetup into the virtual space. So we, we know we gotta we gotta have a way for people to to hang out and stuff, um, at least until this pandemic is over. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so uh, so thanks again, Fred. Uh, thanks so much. Is there anything you want to say before we go? Uh, no, just thanks for having me. Really, and thank you for running this. Honestly, it's such a cool uh, venue. So really excited. To, uh, yeah, I'll be <laughs> I'll be there for the uh, happy hour. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for showing this with us here, and uh, it, uh, again, you know, for for prepping it and, and doing the live coding because you know it, it, it's always it's always scary, and you got to be brave to do it. So, uh, no. <laughs> not brave, just stupid, just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Cool. All right. So uh, we'll see you all over there on on uh, the uh, Speakeasy uh, Happy Hour. Okay. Bye, everybody. Oh.